that. All right, we are recording. So class, we have a great speaker today. We have Neil Schwartz, who is the, would you say the president and owner, or how do you like to introduce yourself that way? Uh, president, Grand Poobah, whatever you want to call me. Head honcho, jefe, uh, whatever, you, yeah. <laughs> of uh, SCRNet, the uh, SCRNet is a great resource company for secondary data. They do uh, mass surveying to understand uh, a lot of different sports. Um, we are lucky enough at GW to have access to it uh, for the research and anything outside of that. So um, and Neil's here to talk through both uh, SCRNet, uh, how to use the website and Give you a few pointers on research and like he said i've prepped him on what the projects are and so he's uh armed and ready to start going through them with I that, am. give the floor to you neil so i want to thank professor uh nickerson and also ava for uh inviting me in and uh you know it's been my pleasure over the years to work with uh dr Narodi and and others at gw and i've worked with professor uh nickerson a number of times uh as he mentioned, I am uh, Neil Schwartz, president of SBRNet. SBRNet stands for Sports Business Research Network. Um, we are the exclusive providers of the sports market analytics data platform. And really at the heart of things, I am a data guy. And um, I, I, I work with students like yourselves at all levels to help them understand and kind of demystify the process of using data. Because even though you know, there can be a lot of, um, you know, complication. There could be a lot of interesting things, or there could be some, you know, a little bit of trepidation about entering into the data world. It doesn't have to be that tough. It doesn't have to be that difficult. But as Professor Nickerson said, you know, data is really there to answer the tough questions. And before you can answer questions, you got to ask them. And my data in particular, um, is a really a great tool that allows you to be able to understand what are the questions that you want to answer, ask, and then what are the answers that you're hoping to get. Now, of course, you don't want to bias the data, but we're going to talk a little bit about developing, you know, a survey based upon, you know, what you're seeing, what's going on, and all that. So what I thought I would do is, number one, I did speak to Professor Nickerson about what some of your projects are there are some of them i have to tell you i I'm, i don't know how much i'm going to be able to do i know that somebody's working with like soda city football club did i get that right yep you know that one that one might skip over me a little bit but i know one of you is working also with the ny uh new york football club that's a good one by the way because i've actually personally done some work with them so i do know what's going on i know that somebody's also working with the uh Texas Rangers. Who's working with the Rangers? They, they don't know yet who's got who. Uh, <laughs> the, somebody's uh, working with the Rangers. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I also know that somebody's working with uh, – uh, uh, who else? I was um, I was looking – oh, U.S. Table Tennis? I guess they don't know that either, right? So I'm spilling the beans here. <laughs> so let me do this. Let me walk you through a little bit about our data – how, and what it is, what it represents. We're going to get into a little bit more specifically how you might use it in order to help you develop your various research questionnaires, your methodology, um, what it is that is going to be used as far as your projects. And then, um, you know, we're going to stop in the middle. Um, I kind of programmed in a little bit of a break, mostly for me because I'm old and I have to run to the bathroom or I'd like to get a drink. Um, but, you know, we'll stop in the middle. And then um, the second part, I'd like to get into a little bit more of the specifics, talk a little bit more about the Rangers project, talk a little bit more about the uh, NY, uh, New York uh, Football Club project, talk a little bit more about, uh, help me there, Professor Nickerson, what's the other one you gave me? USA Table Tennis, and how different sorts of data can really help guide you in the direction. So let me tell you a little bit about me and my company. So um, SBR has been around actually for quite some time, since 1994. I haven't owned it that long. I've only owned it for the last four years. But prior to that, I do have 25 years of experience in the sports data business. I have always been a sports data guy. And I love sports. For me, 
talking about sports, a business about sports, working in sports. There is no better, in my opinion, place for Neil Schwartz to be than in the sports data business. And I will tell you that I love sports, and somebody asked me today why I love sports, and there's one, there's one word, fun. Sports are fun. You know, we're not going to cure the world's ills. We're not going to solve the world's problems. We're not going to cure can We're not doing any of that. What we're talking about is fun. We're talking about putting more butts in seats, if that's what we're going to be looking at. We talk about increasing sponsorship revenue, if that's something we want to look at. We talk about how a team, um, you know, that and may not have been doing well in terms of fan engagement, can increase their fan engagement. And what are the ways that we can measure success and, you know, then measure failure if that in case, if that is in fact the case. So again, I am a data guy. It's what I focus on. Um, I do often, often love to talk about stories. I do present stories. But when it comes time for decision making, when it comes time for strategic direction, when it comes time for survey development, when it comes time for what I would call where the rubber meets the road, it's all about the facts. Give me the facts. Don't give me the, you know, don't give me your anecdotal stories. Don't give me, a, hey, I saw this happen, or my, you know, my brother-in-law told me this. I, I don't want to hear it. Tell me, give me the facts. And, and my company, we deal in facts, and we deal in facts in a, oh, I forgot I wasn't sharing. I just realized something. My bad. I'm going to actually go backwards for a second. And, and Neil, uh, I think one of the one of the cameras is set up so you can see the, the students there. If, I uh, can. A Ava, thank you very much for doing that. Here. That was a request. Proving. <laughs> so thank you. So my company, um, essentially, what we do is we are a one-stop kind of data platform, information platform that you will be able to use for your projects. And we specialize really in four different types of information. One is that we have what I would call factual data based on product sales, equipment, footwear, apparel, based on participation, sports participation data, who's playing what, how often, who they are, you know, all that good stuff. But what we're most noted for is our sports fan data. We do our own proprietary study of sports fans every year. We've done it for 12 years. I've run it for the last four years that I've owned the business. This year, it's going to be bigger and better than ever. I love saying that. Um, we measure 19 sports. So all team sports, all professional individual sports, all amateur, um, amateur minor league, oh man, minor league hockey, minor league baseball, um, college basketball, college football, esports, golf, tennis, auto racing. I know I'm missing one or two. I, I'll, if I come up with it, I'll remember. But the key thing is 19 sports across 65 separate categories of data. So I have the answers to who. I have the answers to what. I have the answers to where. I have the answers to when. Tougher answer is sometimes why. Why is always the tough answer. But I've got a lot of whys too, and whys are something that we can talk about because who, what, when, where can lead you to why. And that's something that I hope that, you know, as we're going through some of these projects tonight and talking about the data, how to find it, how to get it, and what to do with it, we'll get to that point. By the way, if we, I say something, you have a question, I don't mind you interrupting me, raising your hand. I, I would say throwing a piece of paper at me, but of course, you know, you can't really throw a piece of paper at the screen. But again, if you've got a question, I say something, you know, please don't hesitate to stop me. A, it gives me a chance to have a drink. And B, you know what? Sometimes I even get tired of hearing my own voice, which my wife is in the next room would say, I never get tired of hearing my own voice, but mm, maybe I do. So again, the fan data that we have covers a wide variety, 65 categories of data from, you know, fan demographics to um, how they watch. You know, do they watch on traditional TV or are they watching via streaming? Hey, let me ask you a question here. How many of you 
watched any football the past weekend by show of hands? How many? It looks like it's almost all of you. Okay, here comes the next question. How many of you watched via traditional TV? So that would be TV, cable, satellite. Me, anybody else? How many of you watched via streaming? Seems like a larger percentage. Hey, we just did a survey. We just found out that more people are watching the playoff games via streaming than they are traditional TV. And you know what? That's the kind of data that we have. You know, we look at everything from, just like I said, traditional versus streaming versus social media engagement, including um, sports tourism, gambling, um, you know, fantasy uh, play, I said gambling, um, licensed merch sales, really all of the things that go into making a sports fan. And you know what? There are different kinds of sports fans. Let me ask you a question. Who here is a fan? I don't know. Who here is a fan of one of the teams that's in the playoffs right now? I don't know. The the Chiefs or the – I forget who's in the playoffs right now. The Chiefs. Anybody a fan of the Ravens? Um, Tell me a little bit about why you think you're a fan. This is, do you, you know, do, are you from Baltimore? Do you go to the games? Do you watch them on TV? What, what, you know, do you own a Ravens jersey? Yeah. Bernstein, I do not, but I went to the University of Maryland, so I'm pretty close to that school. Yeah. Okay. You know, I consider myself a Miami Dolphin fan. But I'm a, I'm a Dolphin fan that watches all the games on TV and just lays on his couch and watches the game or sits on his couch and watches the game. Now, this year I did go to one game, but as a general rule, I don't go to any games live. Am I a better fan if I go to games live, if I buy some merchandise, if I, you know, support the advertisers that are sponsoring the Dolphins, then just the guy that is watching on TV. What do you think the answer to that question is? Anybody want to take a run at it? No. I'm not much of a fan. I, am, I consider myself a fan. I'm just not as engaged. I'm not as valuable. The guy who's buying licensed merch, the guy who's gambling, the guy who's, or woman that's playing fantasy sports, the woman that's, uh, you know, patronizing some of the uh, advertisers and and sponsors um you know those people are the ones that i would say are the more avid fans and we talk about fan avidity all the time but we're going to talk a little bit about what makes a fan and then in this case you know what are those categories that kind of goes into the to the soup because frankly most answering most questions using data is all about like making soup you need a recipe. Well, what's that recipe going to be? Well, again, secondary data is a great source that will help you develop your recipe. The ingredients that go in the recipe, data. How you mix them becomes a little bit more of the art form, a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that, and then you learn how to create the final product, the final recommendations, the final strategy, all of that sort of thing. So we are going to focus a little bit today on not just data, but also the process. As Professor Nicholson, Nicholson will tell you, I am a process guy because I believe if you follow the process, you will, in fact, be more successful versus just throwing crap up on the wall and hoping something sticks, you know? The spaghetti method or spaghetti on the wall method, as my ex-boss used to call it. That's not me. I am data-driven. I'd like to tell a story with data and insights. Why? Because it brings things to life. It gives things context. It makes things, you know, easier to understand, to visualize, to conceptualize, to see, to understand. But think of data and think of the process as paving the road to accomplishing what it is you want to accomplish. So, for instance, if you're going to be assigned the New York Football Club, you know what? You've got an interesting situation because there's the New York Red Bulls in New York, which are the dominant MLS team. You're number two. How can you increase engagement for New York FC to help them make more money, to get better players, to get into a bigger stadium, to sell more advertising, so forth 
and so on. Think of secondary data, though, as being something that leads you into your primary questions. One of you is going to be working on U.S. table tennis. And I know you've not assigned anything right yet, Professor, correct? Correct. So if somebody says to you, you know what? We would like you to work with U.S. table tennis. What might be the first question that you might want to ask yourself before you know you even start the process? They might want to take a shot at what the initial question might be, that first big question. Anybody? How about the guy right in front with the uh, wearing the looks like you have a gray hoodie? Did I get it right? Blue jacket. It's hard to see. Oh, uh, I think whoever's got the answer is shouting out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How many people are involved? Oh, how many people are playing table tennis? Pretty simple question. Not hard. Not a big deal. The simple questions are the ones where you get started. But again, you're paving the road to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And secondary data leads you to primary questions. Secondary data is where you start. So first, uh, Professor Nickerson, have you shown them the SBR net site at all yet? No, not yet. Okay, I guess that's going to be my job. That's your heffy. Well, I got it. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. So you access the data from your library website. If you go into your library website, type in Sports Market Analytics or SBR net into the like you know the directory of of um, databases and things like that we will come up and when we come up it will lead you to this at least i hope it will i'm going to minimize this for a minute Let me, can you, on the whole you do yeah, yeah. So. all right can everybody see the sbr net site yes yeah. Yeah. excellent thank you thank you thank you so this is where you start. This is our site, and I'm going to give you kind of a little bit of a, a clue or a start as to where everything is located. The first thing, though, and the single most important thing is I always tell people to start in the upper right-hand corner. Why? Well, the upper right-hand corner is what we call our curated search. Why is it curated? Because I have a group of analysts that are already curating articles for all of the different sports media publications in order to be able to save you time from having to Google stuff. Although Googling stuff still works. ChatGPT works great. I use, uh, I use one of the other AI assistants. I forgot what it's called. Works terrific. But for me, I advise people to always start in the upper right hand corner so in this case what we'll do is we'll type in i don't know let's type in major league soccer or mls let's just go for short how's that sound and hit enter when you put it when you put something in what will come up is our our search page and we have not it looks like we're a little behind on our update i'm going to get on kevin Oh, we you know what? Kevin's away anyway. But what we're going to do is we're going to, on the left-hand side, you will see a list of relevant articles that you could take a look at. It's a wonderful place to give you a good start. Here's an example. This is something that I just saw. New York FC to build first fully electric soccer stadium for the MLS. I have no idea what that is. But right away, if you're working and working on the New York FC, guess what? You've now got the beginning of what's going on with that particular subject. We, you know, we really try to make things easy. Those of you that are going to do the Texas Rangers. And, oops, Yexus. I know how to spell Texas, I swear. So again, you type in Texas Rangers, and again, information comes up 
directly related to what it is you are looking to understand or research. I always recommend starting in the upper right hand corner. It's as simple as that. Hang on, get a drink. Down the middle of the page, we've got a list of different research that's available related to that particular subject. And then on the right hand side, we have a series of directories that we offer. Now, these directories are great. You're not going to use them as much, but what you're arguing when you are going to use them is when you start looking for a job, it's a great source of information. Curiosity, curiously, how many of you are interested in a job in the sports business once you graduate from school? Just by raise of hands, by show of hands. Okay. So about what? I see like four or five. Sports business is a great business. I will tell you that much. If, you, if you're looking to, to be able to combine something you love and, and something you can enjoy and something to have fun with, there's nothing better than the sports business, in my opinion. I know some of you would like to end up on Wall Street, you know, cashing some big checks, and, and I like to call that the dark side. But sports can be an awful lot of fun and an awful lot of, you know, Really a lot of things, a lot of interesting and fun topics. But in the middle is data, and then we have our relevant directories. Now, let's get into looking at some data. Where I always tell people to start, and this is just where you start, is in an area called summaries at the very top. Right here it says single sports summaries. If you select all, down the right hand side, by the way, can you guys all see that or do I need to make it bigger, which I'm doing right now? Is that better? Yeah, that's more helpful. Or do you need it bigger? Bigger still? Maybe a little bit. How's Maybe. that? Even better. Okay. So those are all of the sports that we currently collect data for within the confines of our annual sports fan study. Let me tell you a little bit about that. It's my big research study, and it's out in the field right now. We do it once a year in the first quarter in January. What we're looking to do is to understand the sports fandom habits for around from around 7,000 people. We use a sample of around 7,000 in an internet-based collection. So we are in the we're in the we're in the field right now. Our survey population consists of persons 13 years and older here in the United States, and we balance our collection based on age, income, ethnicity, marital status, did I say education? Yeah, education and geography. So what we are doing is we are building a model of what we believe the United States to look like based on the data from a third party, in this case, the US Census. So I'm building a model, like an architect, you know, you ever seen an architect, they, when they build a building or build a bridge or whatever they're building, they like to build a scale model. I am building a scale model of persons 13 years and older here in the United States. What I'm then doing is I am then collecting to that model across all of these different sports. So as an example, let's use soccer, since I kind of did talk a little bit about it. I'm gonna click on MLS. Now, this is very top line. This is really not where you're gonna be finding the, I would say the answers as, as much as you're gonna want. But what you are gonna find is, again, Remember, I talk about the process. This leads you down that road, down that process. So let's look at it real quickly from the MLS standpoint. So since 2015, the MLS has grown. All of our whole numbers are represented in thousands. So that's not 41,738. That's 41,738,000. You just lop three zeros on the end of every 
whole number you see in SP, on the data. Please remember that. I had somebody this morning who kept saying thousand, thousand. I said, no, it's million. So you can understand the number represents millions. But what do we know? Since 2015, Major League Soccer has grown in fans from 41.7 million up to 46.78 million. It's a lot of growth. In fact, look at the growth from 2021 to 2022. Look at the growth from 2020 to 2022. Look at the growth from 2019 to 2022. There's some, something going on with the MLS. You know, I would, the first thing I would always do, just real quickly, I would be calculating the deltas or the net change between 2019 and 2022, 2019 and 2021, 2019 and 2020. And then I would do it year over year because I would look to find the trend. Is fandom, are the fans growing in an accelerated fashion or are they decelerating? But one of the things that's interesting is that in 2020, by the way, we did not measure live attendance at games. Anybody remember why? Pandemic. People weren't going to games in 2020. We made a decision. Uh, well, I say we, I mean me. Made a decision that we did not want to measure live attendance because we felt what it would do is that one year, that black swan year, where there were no fans going to games, would mess up the trends. So rather than mess up the trends, I took them out on purpose. It's not like it, you know, not like an accident. It was done on purpose because we had a situation in 2020 where people weren't going to games. But let's go down and look down the left hand side, and we can see again a number of the different types of categories. You know, we look at the number of attendees who attended at least one game. And in fact, 40% of MLS fans attend at least one game, which is actually down. It's down year over year. It's down since 2019. It's down. There's no other way to say it. It's down. But look at the numbers of people that attended five or more games a year. That's up. If you saw that number, if I said to you that more people more fans of the MLS are going to four, or more, five or more games a year versus one or more games a year. What conclusion might you draw from that one statement? Anybody want to take a run at it? People that love to go to MLS games love to go to MLS games. And in fact, when you're doing a questionnaire, focused on MLS or any of the soccer questions, you're going to want to get at, you know, frequency. How often does, do you attend a live game? Have you ever attended a live game? So again, remember I told you this data is used to pave your way to your primary objectives or your primary surveys. And then, you know, you go down the list, you look at, you know, you can look at age, you can see there's been a big jump um, with soccer with younger people. If you look at ages 13 to 17, um, it's up substantially from 3.8% of all uh, fans up to 6.1%. In fact, it's almost the highest, 6.2% well, about six years ago. So again, this data is guiding you to where you're going to want to go next. Is everybody kind of seeing how you would do that? you know, male, female, you know, you might see that, you know, this year, look, you know, women only make up 36 and a half percent of all the people that are going live to games. You know, you could look at that in one of two ways, glass half full, glass half empty. Glass half empty says kind of sucks. Only 36.5% of women go to MLS games. You know what? Why should I target them? Glass half empty guy says, you know what? That, to me, represents an opportunity. There might be some white space there that we can go after more women when it comes to soccer. So, again, it guides you in terms of the next direction. It guides you to the next step. Everybody kind of seeing how I'm kind of building that story? I'm going to do another one real quick. 
So again, all of our fan data starts here in the summary section. Over here in single sport reports. Now, there are a number of other reports that are here. These are special reports that we've done. I don't know why. Here we These are special reports that we've done on special subjects. You know, you can go through them if you want. If you think something's there, that would be really important and all that. But again, all of that data is also right here in the single sport summaries. So now let's look over here. One of you is going to have work with the U.S. Table Tennis Association. You know what? You're going to, what did we, we said the first question to ask was, how many people are playing table tennis? Well, guess what? You come here to find out that data. Because here is where we have our participation data. So left-hand side, participation data, ba-boom. And to go right to table tennis. And here we are. We're going to be there in a second. So now, here's our table tennis participation data. Also, by the way, in thousands. So that means in 2022, there are 11,322,000 people who play table tennis at least 49 times, uh, from zero to 49 times a year. So when we measure participation, we measure it in really two ways. We measure what they call casual. You know, these are people that maybe play once in a while in a bar, maybe play once in a while with their friends, but they're not serious players. So those are casual players. We then scroll down to get to the core participant. And the core participants, those are serious players. They're playing at least 50 times a year. And so what's have... interesting, what? Go ahead. Um... No, you go. Um, so with NYCFC, you said you didn't, you didn't take data for live attendance for 2020 because it would impact the trend. Um, I'm just wondering why do you think it's fair to take participation for this in 2020? Because it seems like 2020 was the peak for both of these for under 49 and over 49. You know, people playing table tennis, though, they were able to go play. They just... You know, you play with your friends, you play with a partner, you play, in other words, you know, people didn't want to be in large crowds. And in fact, the CDC said it wasn't a good idea to be in a large crowd. So, you know, it's simply a matter of, you know, not being in, in you know, a football stadium with 50,000 or in a basketball stadium with 20,000 versus just, you know, playing table tennis, even, you know, out with friends or family or, you know, whatever it might be. So participation and um, live attendance are, are, you know, are really uh, mutually exclusive. They're, they don't necessarily relate to one another. No, that's, I was just wondering, if you scroll up to the under 49. Yep. I was just wondering on that part because it seems, or the, the graph at the top, that like that doesn't follow the trend that it was going from 2015 on. I was just wondering if that, like, and then it drops significantly back off in 2021. I, I mean, it looks like it became, you know, it was very popular. It looks like it was, you know, just kind of, meet, you know, neither here nor there back in 18, 19, you know, in 2020 during the year of the pandemic, it looks like it picked up substantially, you know, as probably people were hanging out at home and, you know, if they had a table tennis, you know, if they were able to play it at home, they were playing it at home and that's reflected here. But what happens when we're all let back outside or all out to go to events, you know, those numbers drifted off, um, I would say, you know, from the trend. But that's, you know, part of what it is you're going to have to kind of stake out in your primary research. You know, if you started playing table tennis during the pandemic, why didn't you keep playing it? You know? So, you know, the, the pandemic created a lot of interesting trends. I will tell you also, there's a little thing going on that I think is really interesting about table tennis. And when the group gets it, I'll, I'll be happy to talk with you about it. I think that te table tennis has an issue and the same issue that golf has. The issue is 
They can get people to try it. They just can't get people to stay. And that's what's going on right here. They can get people to try under 49 times a year, but they can't get people to stay to play 50 or more times a year. Because when people play 50 or more times, what happens? They spend more, they watch more, they spend more, they do more. So there is a direct correlation in a lot of ways between, let's say, getting people to try something and then getting people to stay. Ping pong, it looks to me, in my considered judgment, or table tennis, excuse me, I don't like you to call it ping pong, table tennis, that they can get, they got people to try it, but once the pandemic kind of eased up, they could not get people to keep playing. What it is that, what was it that they liked during the pandemic that they're not finding now? Gee, do you have a question? Yeah, that's a question for a uh, survey. Another question? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, why the number is 49, uh, 49 times per year? Where, where, uh, where the... <laughs> you know what? That was arbitrary on, on our part. That was arbitrary on the people that do the participation study. We buy this data from the Sports and Fitness Industry Association. And by the way, I used to do this data for them for four years. It's a number that we uh, basically arbitrarily assigned when we spoke to the national governing body that they felt comfortable about calling that casual versus core. It's not, it's not a number that we um, um, created as a result of, let's say, the average play. Because I can get you the average number of times people play, what they call instances, but the, the, the under 40, I mean, over 49, under 49, over 49 was an arbitrary decision that we made. Is that just for table tennis or is that across? No, no. For instance, for instance, team sports, completely different set of circumstances. As of, let me show, here, let me show you. Best place to do it is to show. So let's pick a team sport. Let's go back to our friend soccer. I forgot how to spell it. Here we go. Outdoor soccer. Okay, in this case, it is 49. God, it made a liar out of me. <laughs> All right, let's find something else. Let's say swimming. Still 49. It appears that 49 has become the number. <laughs> this is the once a week. Do you do it once Looks a week? Looks like it's the number, once a week. Yeah, I ask because I, I've done uh, research myself when I work in, a, uh, running my, in the studio. The number is uh, once per week. That's the number that keep people in habit to, to carry on. Let me right. practice. But the thing is, though, you know, that's the, if that's, let's say, what a casual player or even an, you know, an, we have this number here also, by the way, down here called total. So we look at the total number, which, by the way, is the is the you know the average of the two of total of core plus um, you know core and casual. So you know this is a number that also is really valuable is that total participation. And, and, I mean, in this case, it's running. And as you can see, you know, running, you know, while they were able to again grow during the pandemic, they weren't able to keep them as much. Like they've lost about a million participants, it looks like, since the pandemic, which is a lot of people, I might add. So, um, you know, there is a case where, you know, I just, and I, of course, notice that there's a problem with the numbers, but I'll fix that. So, um, actually, let me make a note of something right before I forget. And, and then we got a question for you, Neil. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Uh, speaking about table tennis and its problem, I feel like the problem that table tennis has is the perception of it. Um, how people who play casually perceive it, or the people who play it competitively, or the poor performance. Um, because most people who play table tennis casually do not even know that it's a sport or it exists, a competitive scene in table tennis exists. 
So if we look at the data of how many casual players watch the sport versus how many core participants watch the sport, we might get the data on perception. So is that something that's available on the website? Not here. It's good. It'll be available in your survey that you're going to do, you know, to the database of table tennis players. But can I tell you something you just did there? What's your first name? Arun. A R. What is it? Um, it's spelled A R U N. Arun. Arun. Okay. Yeah. Arun, you did something there that is really important for you to all make sure you avoid. And that is to interject your own personal, own personal would be redundant, biases into what you think might be going on. You said, Arun, that you felt that the average person or most people really don't, you know, know that much about table tennis or don't understand it or don't. You don't know that. Don't assume. This is why you are in this class. And this is why you're going to be assigned to do a primary study in order to get at that information. Don't, you know what I always say to people? Never overlay your own thoughts, feelings, and perceptions on top of the research you're doing, because that is the first way to get yourself in trouble. I do this, therefore everybody does that. Or I think this, Therefore, everybody think no, that's just not the way it is. You got to kind of cut yourself out of that equation and make sure that you ask questions, survey a group of people that will allow you to get to the facts. Using yourself as the survey population doesn't do that. Professor Nixon, I think we're at about break time. Yeah, that's all right. So if you even want to hit pause on the recording for a minute. Yes. All right, we're recording now. There you go. So I want to welcome everybody back. Give me a chance to go to the bathroom and get a drink of water. Before I start getting into the data and before I start talking a little bit more about specifics, I want to, I have something I want to ask if you look, I do this, um, I, base, I don't get paid. Okay, I, I, I do not get paid for this. Obviously, GW does subscribe to the data, and, and I appreciate that a lot. But what would really also help me is if you could follow us on social media, um, on LinkedIn, we're SBRNet, type it in, we'll come up. Instagram, it's SBRNet data. Again, type it in, we'll come up, or even at SBRNet. Twitter or X, now I have to admit, I'm not doing as much on that, but again, SBRnet, um, our actual handle is at R-N-E-T-S-B, but because SBRnet wasn't available. I would really like it if you would follow me on social media. I do a lot of posting focused on data and, of course, about the business of sports. So that would be really wonderful if you could help me out. So now what are we going to do? So now what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at some specific uses of how you will use the data and where you will get it and how you will use it. We're going to start off with our MLS example of the New York Football Club. Now, I know no, no one knows who has what yet, and that's fine. So the data we're going to use for this example, you will find again on the SBRnet site, but this time you will click on the premium tab right here. You have access to all of our premium data. The data that you'll initially look at is in what we call our first area or fan studies. This is where all of the data that we collect is aggregated or congregated. So literally, we've been putting the data out since 2017 for all of the sports that we currently measure. There's a lot of data here. Each one of these sports has over 300,000 data points assigned to it. Now, that's a lot of data, but we're not going to ask you to work with all of that. that. That'd be ridiculous. But again, here is where you will get at the data you need. So in this case, you'll probably want to work with, if you work with the MLS, the 2022 MLS fan study. The 2023 data will go up in March 
It is not available yet because, as you know, we are in the field right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull some of that data up, which I've already done. I hope. Yes, I am. And I'm going to put it in front of this. And I hope that it'll be okay. I'll make it bigger. Let's start off here. So this is a data file where we have, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. That I did not need to do, hang on. This is a data file where all of the data is contained for the individual sports as well as the individual teams. So number one is the methodology. First tab on every page is the methodology. I will tell you now that you need to know where this data comes from. If at any point during your presentation, somebody asks you the question, hey, where does this data come from and you can't answer it? You're in trouble. You're in big trouble because you will have lost all credibility right from the jump. You want to make sure that you understand where this data comes from. The next tab over on all the data, and I'm going to make it bigger, I promise. Everybody see that? I think so. Oh, yeah. Can you see it? Yep. These are all 65 of the categories that we measure. And what I've done is I have literally anchored the data so that you don't, to a link. So you do not have to scroll through these spreadsheets because there's 65 tabs down here. So literally all of the categories are shown from, you know, line one all the way down to line 65. So where do we like to start? I always love to start right here in attended or watched. So what are we looking at? I'm going to go all the way back. So this is attended or watched. Can everybody see this? I'm going to make it even bigger. Now, is that any better? Yeah, but what if I met? Does it need even bigger than that? This, um, yeah, make it a little bit bigger, Neil. And the question was. How's that? Uh, yeah. Can, can you go uh, back to that main page again, just to explain how you jumped to the, uh, yeah, to the tab? Okay, sure. Yeah. So you start off with the contents. Yeah, I think that part's hard to see. So he's on the tab that says contents at the very bottom after he downloaded the Excel file. Yeah, I can't make those any bigger, unfortunately, the tabs themselves. It's a, it's I mean, I guess I could, but I don't really know how. Yeah, it's a but, set up on there. Yeah, but these are going to be the files that you're going to be working with. And then you're going to pick out which particular area you want to focus on. I'm going to pick attended or watched. Can everybody see this data? Yep. Yes, no, maybe. Now, the beauty is all of the data is already in Excel. I have done the work for you of getting it into Excel. All you're going to need to do is copy and paste what you need into, let's say, a separate Excel sheet or a separate sheet within this file. But let's look at it real quickly. So what do we know? We know that 46, that soccer, MLS has 46,784,000 fans. A fan is defined as somebody who attends at least one game or watches one game on TV or streaming. 29,696,000 are men or male. 17,088,000 are women. If you go down to the line 11, it breaks down to 63.5 to 36.5. It doesn't always equal 100%, by the way, just because of rounding. We then look at attended. So attended, 4,224,000 males, 1,823,000 females. So what do we do then? That's Two numbers here, line 13, 14.2% of all males that are fans of MLS have attended. 10.7% of females that are fans of MLS are um, have attended. Or it breaks down to 
almost a 70-30 split male versus female in terms of total attendance. You might look at that and say, hmm, that might be an area where we can grow. Now, the red numbers below it are what they call an index. Indexes can be a little bit interesting because the index is a measure against the average or the median. So for instance, for men, you are 10%, 100 being average, by the way, 100 is the average. So you are 10% more likely to see a male at an MLS game than the average MLS fan whereas you're 17% less likely to see a woman at an MLS event. So you can use these numbers in a variety of different ways. You know, one of the things I wanna look, one of the things I personally love using, and I've talked a lot about this recently, has been the generations. Team sports in general has a Gen Z problem. Gen Zs are those people that are 13, they're not gonna be 13 to 26 years of age. So again, what we're looking at here is the breakdown of fans of the MLS in attendance and watched in thousands, of course it's millions, at 16 point, 16.1 million, well, 8.2 million Gen Z, 16.1 million millennials, 12.9 million, almost 13 million Gen Xers, 8.3 million boomers. And there's the percentages right there, how it breaks down. You know what I would do if I was explaining it? I would take these numbers right there and throw them into a pie chart. Boom. You got yourself a chart. You got yourself your first kind of a piece of insight. So what I might, you might want to say, and you might want to say, okay, what we want to find out is what would it take to get more young people, Gen Zs, to come out to major league soccer games? They're not doing, you know, they, they under index, oh, they actually, they index almost a little bit above average, but there's a lot less of them. You're always weighing the volume versus the likelihood. It, and I know what I'm saying is, a little difficult sometimes to understand for the first time. I know that. When we look at attendance though, again, we break it down by one, two to four, five plus. When we break down watch, we break it down watch via antenna cable, um, total or watch via streaming. For a lot of sports right now, streaming has become the answer to a lot of problems. That may be something that you're going to want to focus on in your primary survey. You know, what streaming networks do soccer fans subscribe to? By the way, I've got that data here, but you might want to ask that question because the question you might ask might be slightly different than the one I asked. Now, here's the interesting part. Hang on. And, and to add to that, you may also want to ask this question because your sampling group or who you're sampling is different than Neil's. Absolutely. Way, you can explain the difference then of the average, the general average of what Neil has to your concentrated group that you're serving. So another reason to, you may end up asking the same question again. <laughs> I just made this giant actually too big. Hold on. I can't, now I can't even see it. It's too big. So the, one of the good things about our data is it's available all the way down to the team level. Yikes. <laughs> and again, 230 seems to be the magic number. And again, all of the same questions that I ask in the basic survey now applied to the individual teams. So I literally have all of the same data but now drill down to the teams. So remember what I said earlier about the New York City FC. You know, they've got a lot less fans than the Red Bulls. New York FC has 1.1 million, Red Bulls 2.1 million. It might be interesting to understand why, who they are, 
You know, is there a difference in the ethnic makeup of the two different fan bases? So again, you've got the ability to drill down and create a question. You might ask a question to you, the New York FC fans. What other MLS teams are you fan a fan of? Mm. Right? Why might that be an important question to ask? Does anybody want to take a shot at that? Anyone? Let's say you want to grow fans of New York, the New York Football Club. Who knows what happened this year down in Miami that made history from the MLS? Uh, What's the big story? In Miami. Messi. Got it. I could talk about it for hours. But you might want to say, you know what we're going to do? I want to look and understand who are fans of, let's say, the Miami Football Club. Because what I want to do is when he comes to New York to play for the Red Bulls, I want to make sure that I understand who are those fans that are fans of both clubs, both teams, because I want to promote specifically, I want to use the right social media. I want to make sure I get the correct messaging. I want to make sure that I get the right balance of, let's say, um, Hispanic media versus um, Anglo media. So you get the opportunity to be able to identify targets. And that's what you can do using this data. Really important that you really understand using the data to ask questions. And then it creates another question. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you just, now, it can create a variety of different types of questions also, by the way. You know, your questions don't have to, you know, you can be true, you can ask true or false, yes or no, multiple choice, short answer questions. I will tell you to try to avoid short answer questions as much as possible. Why? They're impossible to code. Yes, no, one, two. True, false, one, two. You know, A, B, C, D, easy to code, easy to understand, easy to develop a cross tab. But if somebody says, if you ask somebody, um, in, your, in your opinion, you know, what do you like about uh, soccer? You know, they'll go on and say, well, I like that there's a lot of action. You can't code that. You know, maybe you could code it off the keyword action or something like that, but try to make your questions forced choice of some sort. Yes, no, ABCD, multiple choice, true, false, something like that. Try to avoid write-in questions at all costs. Can't always do it. I, I'm, I'm a big fan, by the way, of something called the word cloud. Anybody know what a word cloud is? I don't have a, I don't have one here to show. But a word cloud allows you to be able to focus on one specific word. So when I think of soccer, what word comes to mind? You know, some people would say, you know, boring. Some might say exciting. Some might say fun. You know, and, and the amount of times a specific word comes up, that's the amount of times that that particular um, you know, that particular word will come into play. Let's do the next one. We told, we're going to talk a little bit about baseball. Again, find your data right here. We go to baseball. Sorry, I can't do everybody. Be here all night. <laughs> I'm moving baseball over to the, to let me know. Interestingly enough, Baseball, we ask the same questions. We ask the same questions. So when you're looking at baseball, you're looking at the same sort of information. But baseball, you've got 110.4 110 million fans, of which 68 million are male, 42 uh, million are female. The percentage amount of female is a little different than it is, let's say, for soccer. So again, understanding the differences what might it take to get more women to the ballpark to watch games that might be an interesting question to ask 
But the other thing is that I know for a fact, I know for a fact that baseball attendance is has essentially been flat or up a little bit, but watched is way up. Because I, I look back, I went back, I cheated. I went back and looked at 2021, went back and looked at 2020, and I know for a fact, and you could do the same thing, you know, to identify the trend. I know that if it weren't for streaming, that baseball would be in a, a heap of trouble right now, a heap of trouble. Baseball's slow. They've done a number of things to speed it up. But again, in your questions, you can ask, you know, if you've been to a baseball game or watched to a baseball game, do you find that it is, you know, faster than last year, slightly faster than last year, the same as last year, slightly slower, slower, or no change? So again, you can ask questions related to why people may or may not go, why people may or may not watch. And then you have the ability to cross tab that data like I do. In this case, I cross tab it by team. So, oh wait, I know that's way too small. Hang on, just give me a second here to get set. And uh, what's the number? I like 230. All right, so there we go. So now, this data should look a little familiar in terms of what we just looked at with soccer. But here are, is the data broken down on the team by team basis. And those of you that are going to do the Texas Rangers, just go all the way over here to Texas. And you can look and see exactly what's going on with the Texas Rangers. You know, one of the things I love to do when I'm deciding how to do questions, I love to benchmark. If a team is overperforming in an area, I want to know why. If a team is underperforming in an area, I want to know why. I want to know why. But I don't assume that I know why. All I assume that I know is what the data says, which says that I am overachieving in certain areas versus the average. Now, here's an example. If I go back here to very, very beginning, we know that the average baseball fan attended at least 27.7% of all baseball fans attended at least one game. You with me? 27.7. Somebody remember that number because I'm going to forget it. Now I go over here to the Texas Rangers and what do I see? What was that number that I said for the Texas Rangers? <clears throat> or, I'm sorry, for the league in general. But look at the Rangers. They're 28.9. So 28.9% of Texas Rangers fans go to at least one game. I'd want to know why they're overachieving a little bit. Maybe people love the ballpark. I've been to the ballpark, and it's a beautiful place. Maybe people like the food at the ballpark. I've had the food at the ballpark. Food's pretty good. Um, you know, maybe there's, there's – now, well, this year they won the World Series, so, I mean, that's going to give you a reason to want to go, too. But so what I'm always looking to do is to understand what's going on and then develop my questions accordingly. And, and Neil, you have that by age as well, right? Like, I, I relative, do. Right? I do. I have it by age. Small. No, I'm just kidding. Hang on. I'm going to make it bigger. And it would be. So I have it by age right here. I have a gender and age. Um, I usually put gender and age together, but not always. So here I have, you know, plan to attend uh, gender and age. So I have it by men, women, so forth. So the answer is yes, I've got all that data. Males, females. And again, you can compare one team to another. You can even look at, you know, an interesting case is, you know, you got the Texas Rangers in, in the suburbs of Dallas. You've got the Houston Oilers. Uh, Houston Oilers. 
<laughs> you got the Houston Astros that are in Texas. I don't think there's any more uh, Texas baseball teams. It's just the Astros and the Rangers. You can compare the two of them and see what the differences might be. Now, granted, I will tell you that the demographics of Houston are dramatically different than the demographics of Dallas. But the fans could be very much the same or very different. So, look, I know I've went way over my time, and that's because I talk too much, and I get it, but there's a lot to talk about, and there's a lot to use and a lot to understand. And, Professor, I, I will be happy if you know you need me to come back in to talk or review or – you know, any of that kind of thing. So I'm not going to abandon anybody. I've never have and uh, probably won't do that. Hey, are there any more questions before I have to go? Um, well, when you were talking about table tennis and focusing on participation data, I was mm -hmm. wondering, um, have you looked whether like people become a fan of a sport like before they become participants or vice versa? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I actually did a, so I did a correlation study and I did it specifically for soccer. We're like right now, one of my, uh, one of my uh, industry friends calls it the golden age of soccer. But I said to him, let me ask you a question. Are people a fan of soccer before they play soccer? The answer is in the case of soccer and other team sports, they play the sport first and then they become fans of it. So it's play first, participate first, fan second. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? You have uh, another one here. Yeah, Mr. Schwartz, uh, thank you for coming to speak to our class. My question, actually, speaking on the fact that you just mentioned that colleague of yours describing us in the golden age of soccer. Yes. It's Miami signing, we even know Messi sparking a lot of interest within the, uh, within the U.S. around soccer. How do you think the country will be able to sustain this type of excitement and engagement for years to come? You know, I do, and I'll tell you why. Soccer right now is enjoying a kind of the confluence or the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's almost like the perfect storm. You know, two years ago, when um, you know the World Cup was played, the United States made the knockout round of 16. The, it really, I mean, look, it's always been really high for women, but this past World Cup, the men did really well, and ESPN did an amazing job of broadcasting, an amazing job. And all these games are on. Now, mix that, kind of stick a tack in that one. Now, what I also know is that the demographics here in the United States are obviously changing. The amount of Hispanic population is growing, um, not just for Mexico, but other parts of um, Latin America. So we know that the Latin American population is growing and we know that they tend to gravitate or have an affinity for soccer. Of course, they call it football. So let's put a tack in that one. Now, in 2026, we have the World Cup coming to the United States. In fact, it's coming to three countries, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S., with all the final games, the final 16 games, are all going to be played in the United States. In fact, I think one or maybe two games are going to be played in Texas. So there is a lot of excitement around soccer, and then you've got two other major factors. One is the growth of international soccer here in the United States. And when I say international soccer, I'm not just talking about, you know, the Colombian team or the Venezuelan team or the Argentinians. I'm talking about English Premier League, talking about Champions League, talking about La Liga, Bundesliga, all the other leagues. Again, an incredible amount. These games are on everywhere. Peacock, English Premier League, you can see all the games on Peacock. Um, you know, if you want... Football, you can get plenty of it. And then the last thing, and probably the cherry on top of the soccer Sunday, is Messi coming to the United States. The world's most popular, the great, the GOAT, okay, the GOAT, comes to the United States, decides to join Miami FC, where David Beckham is the owner, 
and they have really been able to amp up everything 50%. So right now, you're looking at a confluence of positive things all came together for the perfect storm for soccer. Okay. Yes. Or, yes. Going back to talking about streaming being such an important factor in sports right now, um, and looking, I think, was most interesting when you were tying through the generational look, how do you feel that writing ticket prices are affecting viewership and attendance and, and actually playing right into the hands of the different streaming companies? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I may have some personal bias here. I, I do think that the sports in some ways have overpriced themselves. By the way, that also is a great question for you to ask in your primary studies, you know, for the Rangers or for any of the professional or co college teams even. You know, does the price of tickets inhibit you from attending live? But I do think, what's your first name? Emily. Emily, I do think that streaming has made everything really easy. They've made it really easy for you to just stay on your couch and get your fill of sports or get your fill of your team. So I do think it is having – here's the thing. It's – the net net effect is positive. You know, if, X, if you're losing a few people on the live attendance side – they're gaining a bunch of people on the streaming side. So there's an expression. I don't know if you ever heard the expression zero sum game. As someone grows, someone goes. In this case, it's not really a zero sum game. It's as streaming grows, live attendance does drop, but streaming's picking up more enough of the slack that it, it makes it work. I mean, just look at what Peacock did with the, uh, NFL playoff game two two weekends ago. I mean, I did a, you know, follow me on social media, scroll back through my last couple of posts. I did a post on the experiment, the NFL Peacock experiment. Here, you ready? Here's my survey question to the class. Do How many people here think that the Peacock experiment of streaming was going to be a success for Peacock and the NFL? How many think it was going to be a failure? Huge success. Huge success. And I produced the numbers to show how I got there. I used the model of Amazon and Thursday Night Football as my model. And I came up with an interesting hypothesis, which got a few of my friends mad because we had to all watch it on Peacock and game ended up sucking, but that's another story altogether. But we live in very interesting times. And if you're going into the sports business, you're going into the sports business in an interesting time. Any other questions? No. Hey, I want, I think we're good. I want to thank, yeah. I want to thank Professor Nickerson and Ava, you know, for allowing me the opportunity to come in. As you can tell, this enthusiasm that I have, it's not fake. It's real. I love sports. I really do. And I could talk about it all day, all night, and my wife would want to kill me. So thank you. Thank you very much for listening and and good luck with your projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate it. And we're done. <laughs> I'm leaving. Bye everybody. Yeah.